Hi everyone, I'm Eric. And I'm Christopher. And we're Grow For Me Gardening. That's right, new year, new me. <laughs> and just like <laughs> our garden, we keep growing and we keep expanding and that is thanks to all of you. Thank you. So thank you so much for joining us in 2023 and we are moving into 2024 and so excited to bring you along with us. So today we are going to start the year out by answering some of your questions that we took from Instagram and from YouTube. Yes, I have not seen any of these. Nope, he has not seen one. All right, so question one comes to us from Esmeralda Galvan. Did both of you love gardening when you met? Will you be adding more roses? Uh, no, both of us did not love gardening when we met. In fact, neither one of us loved gardening when we met. I know that when we first moved in together, our first apartment had a, a deck. Yep. And we grew flowers in containers, and we had no idea what we were doing. And I remember we called them pots instead of containers, and we kept saying, like, We oh. had a pot garden. We kept saying we have a pot <laughs> garden, not realizing the implication of that. But, um, yeah, we didn't fall in love with gardening until we moved into this house in 2018. Yes. And the second part of that question, of course we're adding more roses. Yeah, there's always going to be more roses. All right, second question from Belle. Would you move if your channel continues to grow? Are there plans and hopes for future gardening in this world of yours? Um, I do think we would move, but it wouldn't be for our channel or for social media purposes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we built this home um in 2017 2018 it was a different world it was and a very so different world. you know things change over time and we might stay here for the long haul we might not i mean it really depends we're pretty flexible yeah pretty flexible about that one um plans and hope for the future gardening world of yours yes we have lots of plans for 2024 floating in our atmosphere right now yes the ether is filled with things like that last video when we talked about a greenhouse mm -hmm. or a pond or potential greenhouses, potential water features. Um, there's a lot of potential collaborations that are in the works. And I think it's really exciting and it's really fun. But we still have so much work we can do <laughs> in this space and we can add more things. We have a lot of grass. There's so a lot of grass. anywhere we have grass, we can have garden instead. Yeah, why not? Yeah. <laughs> um, this right. is a fun one. Go ahead. If you had a super low budget for the upcoming spring, what would you invest in for the garden? This is one question I had mentioned to Eric before uh, we put the video together. And I think he was right. He said perennials that you can divide and also shrubs that could be propagated. Mm -hmm. So if you're willing to be patient, a low budget garden is very possible. Maybe you start a year behind, two years behind, but you, things grow. Yeah, I mean, I think about things like our walkers, low cat mint that we can purchase like little plugs of that just blows up that first season. Mm -hmm. And then it's really easy to divide um, some shrubs that are really easy to propagate. There's a, there's a lot of different types of hydrangeas that are easy to propagate that grow very quickly. I mean, propagating is, you know, iffy. You don't want to break mm -hmm. the law, but if you're not reselling them and you're keeping them to yourself in your garden, I don't, I don't think the propagation police are going to come get you, but right. you never know. I mean, and we don't promote breaking the law, no, but no, no, if no, you're no. able to uh, <laughs> propagate a little bit, I say go ahead and do it. And don't forget money. seeds. Yes, starting seeds from starting. seeds. Absolutely. And you know what? There's not a lot my forte, but no, it's not his favorite <laughs> thing, but you can start a lot of seeds by direct selling them in the garden. So low budget and low effort. Mm -hmm. um, we do tend to not do so much direct sowing only because of our control freak nature. We yeah. want to know exactly where stuff comes up. And the garden's too big. I think if you had a much smaller space, you could direct sow and kind of keep a better eye on them. But we're just all over the place all the time <laughs> in the garden. So I think it's hard to really keep your eye on that one spot. All right. And then we have a question from Instagram. This yep. one is from Sandy. How long have you and Christopher been together? Uh, we have been married just over seven years, and we've been together, I think it'll be 10 years in just a month or two. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think it'll be our 10-year getting together anniversary in just a month or two. Mm -hmm. 10 best years of your life. Right, the, I, the, of mine, my <laughs> life. <laughs> All right, what materials were used for your fire pit patio? We are deciding on one, or on how to install one. This is from Mary D., all right, so Mary, we used uh, the fire pit patio was 
uh, it's gravel, but it's crushed gravel. It looks like pea gravel, but it's not pea gravel. It's a crushed gravel so that the gravel locks together better and it's easier to walk on. And that just has landscape fabric under it. It was, you know, it was dug out. It was, you know, the lawn was scalped out and then it was pounded down and then landscape fabric was put down. Edging was put down all around it. And then some stepping stones were sunk in with, you know, they did the sand and all that stuff under yeah. the stepping stones. But everything else was just free crushed gravel around it. And we chose that because we love the aesthetic of it. We love the way it looks. We love the way it sounds when you walk on it. Um, it's very affordable. Yeah, it's very affordable. It's about three inches thick. You don't even need that much of it. But playground pea gravel, like the traditional stuff, yes, it's smooth and soft and very nice. But you know how you always sink in? You don't sink into ours because the crushed gravel locks. Mm -hmm. And I remember the gentleman who installed it, he had said, um, you know, this is not for walking around barefoot on. I've done it. So I don't recommend it. And was there another part to this? We're trying to decide on how to install one. Oh, so yes, we have that metal edging that goes around and it's easy to bend and it's, mm -hmm. it, you know, goes into the ground and then just the landscape fabric and the crushed gravel. Yeah. And then some stepping stones. I put the stepping stones in first, not on top of the crushed gravel. They would go under their own, like, nice smooth surface. Right. So, yeah, hopefully, if you hear, that's Freya in the background. <laughs> She's no screaming reason. for dinner. <laughs> she really wants some food. All right. Our next question is from Tina Cruz. And Tina would like to know, and this is uh, Christopher's area of expertise, she'd like to know, what daffodils do you grow? Have you thought about growing a daffodil lawn? I started one this fall here in Minnesota. Enjoy your holiday season. Thank you, Tina. Well, so what daffodils do you grow, Christopher? Well, first, we did try doing a daffodil lawn. We have the ice follies on the berm. Yeah, I don't know if I call that a daffodil lawn as much as a daffodil extravaganza yeah. up on the berm because we don't really use that as a lawn. Right. I don't think that I would want daffodils in our front lawn or something like that because the greens, you know, the... The leaves have to stay up so long and it does not look very nice after they start to yellow yeah and i'm like a pretty tidy lawn person maybe a cr not even a crocus lawn because that those leaves get really long yeah I don't, i'm not a, a bulbin our lawn maybe in the back lawn but definitely not the front okay um as far as the types you've tried ice follies which is so beautiful and i guess it does um a really good job of naturalizing very mm -hmm. quickly we have some of the long field gardens blends the big blooming blend which has like Dutch Master and then all different colors come in there of yellows and whites. We've got Jetfire, Tete Tete, Pueblo, Tahiti just went in. Others as well. <laughs> Lots Others. of daffodils. <laughs> and wait until you see in the spring when they come up. The last year we actually had put our compost for mulch down right as they were blooming. Mm -hmm. And that color pops. I bet you can put a picture up right now, Christopher. I could. I could totally do that. <laughs> but I love daffodils because the rodents try, tend to stay away from them. The deer tend to stay away from them. They have a bright, beautiful color that, you know, is so nice in the springtime. Yeah. And they smell great, too. <laughs> they do. The backyard, it's funny, that is a time of year when you do not see pests or deer in the garden because the daffodils are so fragrant mm. and they are just smoked out. It's yeah. great. Um, all right. So we have from Jen, trying to plan a bed around my trailer deck. Limited depth space, hide the vinyl skirt, shape plants. So something very shallow. I mean, of course, all of this, Jen, would be very dependent on your growing zone and the lighting and the soil. So not knowing any of those things, I would imagine I'm going to answer it as if this trailer deck is in our yard yep. in zone 5B and gets full sun. So obviously, this is only the only answer I can give you mm -hmm. um, because otherwise we need to know those other factors. But if I had to have something very shallow that had to hide um, the skirt, the vinyl skirt around, I'd probably choose something, and it depends on the height. I would probably do some sort of boxwood, like mm -hmm. a, a narrower boxwood, uh, maybe a sprinter boxwood, which kind of grows more upright than out. What else would be nice for narrow in full sun that would stay kind of blocking it year round? Um, Castle Spire Holly. That, that's a holly that it gets a little bit more of a cone shape, but there's also shorter versions of that. And yeah, I, I guess we don't know how tall it is either. But <laughs> so we're not as helpful as we could be on this, but I would think evergreen. Yeah, I you could do think... tater, tater, tater tot arborvitaes. <laughs> yeah. Because um, those stay in nice season. I'm imagining something low yeah. for some reason in my mind. Like two, three feet high max. Yeah. But I wouldn't do anything, I wouldn't focus on flowering, I wouldn't focus on 
really anything deciduous because if you want to cover a space, you really want that solid evergreen. Yeah, something evergreen. I mean, you could also do um, ornamental grasses around it too because those would stay up over the winter. And then the only time that they would, you would see that vinyl, you could probably alternate ornamental grasses and boxwoods and then yeah. cut the ornamental grasses down in the spring and then they'd be back by midsummer. Yeah, that might work. I don't know. We did our best, Jen. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we have a question from Kathy. Love your channel. If, Thanks, Kathy. <laughs> if budget was no issue, and would e what would each of you add to your garden? Are there any unicorn plants you would like to have but can't mm. find? I have one. Okay. What is yours? My unicorn plant? Yeah. Summer Song, The Rose by David oh, Austin Rose's yes. Summer Song. Apparently you can get it in Europe, but it's this intense orangey coral pink rose that I guess didn't do well in the U.S. I don't, I, know. I don't know. I almost would be willing to just put it in a pot and take it in and out. Summer Song is a beautiful rose. Yeah. My unicorn plant, I have found twigs of it places, but they would not probably survive, is Cornus Controversa variegata, which mm. is the wedding cake dogwood tree. I saw one in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, and I made Eric pull over on the side of the road so I could take a picture of it. Do you remember yeah, that? Yeah, I'm sure we can show the picture now in the video. Yeah, I, if I can find it, that one would take me a while. <laughs> it is one of the coolest trees. I think Carol Klein has one from Gardener's World mm -hmm. at her house. Niles Gardens has one. What? Oh, we gotta go find it. Niall, um, the in Ireland? in Ireland, yeah. Oh, that's his big, a, like, it's a beautiful tree. It is he shows such a it almost every video. It might possibly get too big for our area or for our personal space area. But um, I always say that's a future person problem. Yeah, that is. <laughs> I feel like where it needs to go, like, I, just, I know where it needs to go. And maybe one day I'll have a Cornus Controversa Variegata. And maybe one day I'll have a summer song from David Austin Roses if they ever bring it back. Right. Or if anyone is digging one up, they're getting rid of, and they want us to come pick it up, <laughs> or they want to ship it to us. That'd be great. And then the no budget item. If there was no budget involved at all, I would have a Hartley Botanic Magnum Opus greenhouse. All right. That one, that... the. Oh. I mean, I'm not mad about that. Oh, My so no great. budget item would be a soak swimming pool from soak pools in new hampshire yeah. and just they do a plunge pool you know because i don't want like a full-size pool but they do like beautiful plunge pools that mm -hmm. are incorporated into your landscape so those are really cool i would do a soak pools plunge pool and you would do a magnum opus hartley botanic Green. yeah and then i would have my summer song rose and you could have your wedding cake tree yeah that's all we need folks that's all we need <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jody asks, please share your experience with your roses. The good, the bad, the ugly, newbie to roses. All right, so Jody, I'm going to be honest with you. I was anti-roses the first few yes. years of the garden. And my grandmother, on my mother's side, she, I remember during my childhood, was also very anti-roses because she said they were so much work and they were so hard and she just didn't want to be bothered with them. So as a kid hearing that, and then growing up and just kind of like thinking that, you know, taking that as fact, I was like, oh, well, roses are no good because they're too, you know, it's hard work and we don't want them. So for, I think the first year or two of gardening, Christopher was pushing for a rose or two. And I was like, no, too much work. Then I introduced him to the wonderful world of David Austin roses. It's true. There's a video on YouTube um, by Rebecca oh, Dearden. Gosh. Is it Dearden? It no. I can't think of her last name. Rebecca. <laughs> Um, but she is in charge of the David Austin, David Austin Roses U.S., right? Yes. Or North America. North America. And she did this informational video on YouTube, probably for growers, because you can find all sorts of things on YouTube that aren't intended for the general consumer. Mm -hmm. You know, they put it out for growers or sellers or whatever. And, you know, we just watched it because I wanted right. to learn about them. And this presentation, by the end of it, I was like, sold. Let's we are go. getting some of these roses. I think after that, Vanessa Bell happened. I got a Gertrude Jekyll yeah, for I mean, my birthday. I think, of course, we started with, with like clearance or sale ones because we were afraid of the investment because yeah. they are pricier mm -hmm. rows. And I think our very first one was either Litchfield Angel or Crown Princess Margarita. Or no, it was Mary Rose. Oh, Mary Rose was the first one. You're right. Mm -hmm. 
Yep, and she's in a, a beautiful spot. She's done very well. Beautiful, beautiful color. I think what we've learned, though, is don't buy your David Austin Roses on clearance because everyone yeah. that we've bought on clearance or on sale has struggled yes. and is way behind the ones that we just purchased. Yeah, Bare Root, as much as it seems counterintuitive to buy an ugly bunch of sticks in your hand that show up in a garbage bag, basically, mm -hmm. beautifully wrapped in a gorgeous box, but they're basically a garbage yeah, bag. Yeah, in plastic absolutely the best way we have found to grow yeah, roses. buying the bare roots directly from David Austin Roses were very um, successful. For pests, yes, you're going if you have a super humid area, you're going to get the black spot and all those sorts of things. There are some ways to tackle that. I go around once a week throughout the entire summer with a pump sprayer and I have in it a spray that I can't... What is it? What do I use? It doesn't smell great. It doesn't smell great. <laughs> I So I mix two things together. I have horticultural oil, and it's then I have... Like oh, it's the systemic. It's the leaf systemic. Yeah, but it's like... Turbo... It's not... Is it BT? It's not BT. It's it's one of these sort of like Rose RX kind of products. Yes. But I was doing some reading, and if you mix a little horticultural oil in there, shake it all up in your pump sprayer, it kind of makes everything stick a little bit longer. So I go around and do that once a week, and we have not had black spot. We haven't had black spot. We do battle Japanese beetles. Right. And I know a lot of people ask us about Japanese beetles, and we did battle them this past summer. The spray it was, helped. Yes, it was the least... Japanese beetle summer we have had. Yes, and we'll definitely be discussing all of the rose stuff in the new year because they are such a highlight of any garden that we, we will definitely focus yeah. on that a lot. So my experience with roses was don't be afraid of them. And the new varieties of roses are so much easier than you yes. could imagine. And if you like that David Austin Rose look, Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs also has a new line called Reminiscent that has the same mm -hmm. kind of aesthetic that are just as easy. And they also have their At Last Rose, I would recommend. Um, I like the look of those types of roses. I understand Knockout Roses are a nice rose. I don't particularly mm -hmm. care for the look of them. They don't look like like an old English rose. Right. We definitely like the old English rose style. And not even the, the hybrid tea roses. We don't even have the ones that look like they're at a florist. Yeah. But I'd say give them a shot. They're easier than you think they are, at least for us in our zone. Um, JMZD83 asks, what parameters <laughs> do you use when setting a garden budget? <laughs> we always use a parameter that we never follow. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. the problem. Absolutely. I remember, do you remember when we said we are not going to buy any plants for the month of June? Yeah. That didn't last. I think it was June 3rd and we were buying plants. It's This is our hobby. This is what we love to mm. do. We love to travel, but we also love to garden. So we we put our extra in. That's really where, where we like to do it. Yeah, I, we do. I mean, you know, when it's not gardening season, we have a lot of extra, you know, yeah, there's, play money. I'm like, but, oh. <laughs> <laughs> but when it is garden season, we do spend quite a bit. I mean, in full transparency, though, I mean, as those of you know, like we do work with proven winners mm -hmm. and they do send us a lot of things to plant. And that saves a lot of money, you know, to be fair. Yes. You know, we don't purchase everything that we plant. Right. But, I mean, we purchase I mean, a lot. I mean, we purchase a lot of what we, we really plant. Do. We're going to purchase everything. So I don't want you to think that like we we don't we do get some, some stuff. Shops, yeah. yeah. And some free plants but majority of it, we, we plant ourselves. So yeah, I would say Purchase if you're ourselves. trying to make a good budget for yourself, a good budget plan would be, you know, set yourself a couple of projects, make yourself a few goals. This is what I want to accomplish and see if you can stick to it. And I'll be very impressed if you do. The other thing that's tremendous though is the cost of gardening. Like the cost of plants has skyrocketed, I think, yeah. in the last few years. I've noticed... Um, even in big box stores, because, you know, you're always walking through, you look through there, and you'll see perennials that used to be $8 for 20 mm. So there are a lot of high prices happening right yeah. now. Yeah. All right, so Elaine has asked, I love your garden patio design. Thank you. Was it professionally landscaped? And if so, who also do you have plans to expand beyond the berm or fence in the rear of the garden? Thank you. I designed the patio. Yes, he did. I did. I, we didn't install the patio ourselves. We hired someone to do the labor, but I did design it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, he put a lot of work into it. 
It was all done on graph paper, and as the shape changed, you can see where he was taping pieces of graph yeah, paper. Yeah, I just used a ruler and pencil yeah. and just sketched it out at the back. And, you know, I've been thinking about it for a couple of years, and there's many versions of the patio <laughs> sitting in a drawer in the office, and then this was finally the one we decided on, and initially it was going to be to save money, we were going to do a deck instead of a terrace, but then the gentleman from Peak was like, mm -hmm. uh, the stone terrace is going to be the same cost and it'll be way better. And and I was like, well, that's what we wanted originally. Yeah, that we thought we it thought would be, we, it would be it would cheaper be to do a deck, but it's not cheaper to do a deck. It was a fun process to watch. We actually, one of the first videos that we ever did last year was all about this process. Yeah. Back in July or August, we posted yeah. a video about designing mm -hmm. the patio. That's so if you want to check that out, check it out. Um, I love your, was it professional landscape? It was done by us. We did it. Mm -hmm. We did all the landscaping around it. Um, those shrubs there um, are a lot of proven winners, Palos Royce shrubs. Yep. And then we had purchased the trees uh, to go in there as well. So that was a fun thing. Um, we don't really generally sketch out our gardens on paper, but that is right. one of the times that we did. That is, yeah, we did, We knew what was going where. We and knew how, what we had ordered and what was coming. And we were measuring things out. You know, we have uh -huh. quick fire fab hydrangeas in there and those get big, 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 big. They're going to yeah. be incredible as they grow, but we needed to make sure that there was room and that we could fit everything in. Uh, do you have plans to expand beyond the berm? We don't because it's protected. It is protected. Yeah, we can't expand beyond there. That's actually the, why the berm is there, yep. I'm pretty sure, is for runoff of water. Mm -hmm. Okay, Juan asks, do you have dinner parties outside and do you decorate for them? I'm a theme host. Here in South Texas, we entertain outside during the fall, winter, and spring. Summer's out of the question. Everything melts in 100 plus weather. When do you entertain if you do? Love your channel. Thank you. Thanks. We we do host parties and dinner mm -hmm. parties and stuff, but I don't really decorate. We don't do a theme outside. We haven't really done a theme party <laughs> outside. It's Our garden is the theme. That's it. It's a gardening <laughs> theme. It's always a garden party every time. Um, a lot like you, our, our summers get uh, pretty hot. But what is most annoying about our summers is the humidity. Yeah. And mosquitoes. And mosquitoes. It gets <laughs> very humid and lots of mosquitoes in the summer. So our entertaining outside, besides daytime summer parties, um, I've even we've even had work events here. But um, fall, we've done pizza parties outside mm -hmm. in, a, in, a, in a pizza oven. Oh, the have, uni. <laughs> yep, the uni pizza oven. We have people over in the spring with the fire pit. And uh, we do have people over outside all the time, but not often theme parties. But if you have ideas, let us know. Yeah, that, we could. I mean, I'm open. <laughs> Liz would like to know: Will you be doing a seed haul and seed starting how-to video? This is definitely for Christopher. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, that is the answer. We are going to be doing some seed haul and seed starting videos and sharing very soon the basement greenhouse that we oh, yeah. have. It's <laughs> every time I see it, it makes me giggle. I think it's really funny. I think it's fun though. Um, the very great thing um the other day i asked eric um if i had ordered enough seeds this year and he said you know there's an entire like seed collection in the office apparently i've been ordering seeds all year long and over the fall and leaving them on the kitchen, kitchen counter. counter he opens the mail leaves it on the kitchen counter so of course i clean up after him and i just put them away in the seed box and Yep. So I just discovered a whole bunch of things. I'm really excited to grow. Outside out of mind for him, apparently. Yeah. So just wait. There's some really fun stuff coming. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Plants and cats. Sounds like my kind of person. Yeah. Let's hang out. <laughs> <laughs> Love your channel and garden, by the way. Where do you get your garden art structures? Okay. So garden art structures. Um, the garden art, the hoops, the ellipsis. I think they call it ellipsis, right? Oh, yeah. It's the from Grandin Road. Um, is that our only art out there? I think that's the only that's our art. Only art. Um, and then all of our other big structures, like the trellises and obelisks and things, are all from Gardener Supply. And Christopher can put a link below in the description to all of those things for you. Yeah, very cool um, stuff. Yeah, so mostly Gardener Supply, and then that that's a little bit from um, Grandin Road. Mm -hmm. Next section is favorite container combinations. That's really hard to answer because we've tried so many. And every summer I'm like, this is my favorite. Or every, you know, late spring, early summer, I say, this is my favorite. And then by August, September, I'm like, I'm ready for something new. Yeah. <laughs> so it 
just you're gonna love it all find the things that you love enjoy them and we'll see what we come up with this year who knows what we're gonna do maybe there'll be some i'll say to actually answer the question <laughs> shade um one of my favorite container combinations uh was a total accident and i remember what was in it. it's a full sun container it had the new ringo pink rose from proven winter proven winners it had a newly noir coleus that purplish oh i remember with this. that um those two together looked amazing it had mini vista white mini super junior mini vista white it had a purple fountain grass in it and it had one more like pinkish thing i loved that container i gotta see if i can find a picture yeah that was a really if we can find one. a picture we'll put it up but just like i was really shocked how nice the newly noir looked with pink tones mm -hmm. and i think we should try something like that again okay um i like the idea of adding in we haven't really done shrubs in with our <clears throat> um containers in yeah. the back in a little bit yeah i liked our containers this past season they weren't my favorite though now there were elements that were really good yeah mm -hmm. all right which annual do you think is the most underrated oh artist blue floss flower the azuratum hybrid from proven winners for sure that thing is a beast yes the color is amazing blooms the entire season stays a beautiful nice compact size no pests no yeah disease. that for me was like the shining star of 2023 gardening was the artist blue floss flower hybrid ageratum what about you underrated underrated uh, underrated i'm thinking i don't know i don't know i can't think of one right now all right well that's the next that's is okay the next is overrated or maybe you just don't care for it i already know what he's gonna say i'm gonna say what petunias uh super junior vista bubblegum is not overrated because it is a tremendous performer and a big bang for your buck i it's not my thing sorry jamie yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, what about you? Um, overrated? I don't... Maybe you just don't care for it, Christopher. Maybe things that I just don't care for? What did I not care for? Oh, I know what I think is underrated. Underrated. Um, underrated. We're back to underrated. We're back to underrated. Okay. I think that um, very underrated is the red sweet potato vines. Oh, like the Caroline Mahogany? Yes. There's, Caroline Mahogany? Yes. Those, I don't know. There was something about it. It was just kind of soothing. It wasn't the like bright lime green. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the dark black. It wasn't brown, but just sort of that like yeah. rusty reddish color of those sweet potato vines. I really like that this year. And so what's overrated for you? Because I'm not going to be the only one to expose myself. Oh my gosh. What, would I, <laughs> what is over? What did I complain about? I can't remember. You don't complain. <laughs> How flattering. Um, I know what it is. I think it's the Scavola or the Whirlwind. Yes. I want to like Scavola. I want to. Yeah. And then I don't. I know. <laughs> He's always like, we should try it. And then we try it. And I'm like, mm. we did it in a container. We tried it in the ground. Yeah. I don't know. Then... Maybe it were too wet. It might be too humid for for that yeah, who knows who knows we're way more humid than people think we are yeah all right do oh this is from kelly do you use any type of garden planner not technically we, just our brains the brains um obviously for record keeping we have instagram and youtube mm -hmm. which is very helpful that was kind of why we started instagram was yeah. to just kind of journal our uh garden that's how yeah. we started um, as for planner, like right now we're using a Google Doc. We have Google Docs for perennial planning. We have some Google Docs for stuff that we want to add for structure. So that's yeah, kind we just of kind of make lists and yeah. notes. When there's two brains involved, one of us is bound to remember. Yes. And if we don't remember, then I guess it wasn't that important. Right. But I guess we should probably start Sorry. thinking about that. So if you have suggestions, leave them in the comments. <laughs> yeah, what do you use? <laughs> <laughs> all right, this question is from All Things Travel. This actually is Margaret, who won our giveaway of the ornament. Oh, Margaret, I hope that looks beautiful on your tree. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if you could choose to live anywhere in the world, forget about money or jobs, where would you live and why? <sighs> I have no idea. 
I know where mine is. Mine's the south of France. I mean, which, you oh, know. Oh, ooh la la. Ooh la la. Um, <laughs> when we Pourquoi? went on our, our honeymoon, <laughs> we actually did the, um, in the Mediterranean. You know, we went for, through Italy, France, and Spain. And I loved Nice. I loved, even though it had the rocky beach. Mm-hmm. I remember you were like, I'm getting in the ocean. Yes. <laughs> and uh, it was all rocks. But I love the way that that city set up. And you get on that train and you can go anywhere. I loved it. And the weather was beautiful. Yeah, I can see that. Um, It's tough. I think there's a couple of different places. I think I'd have to explore more before I officially decided. Um, But I would love to live somewhere in England because they have such beautiful gardens in England. That's true. Um, We've had amazing times in Italy. I don't know if I'd want to live there, though. Um, maybe move a little bit south in the United States to like maybe a zone seven or eight where the winters aren't so harsh. Mm. Um, I think there's a lot of places I can't decide just yet. I mean, maybe somewhere in Scandinavia to mm-hmm. the Netherlands or something. No? So Europe or the south of the U.S. Or Canada. I mean, I feel like there's <laughs> so many places have so many great things to offer and so many places have not. I think you have to weigh like, the amazing things that come with that place, and then also like the not great things, because we could mm-hmm. name someplace here, and you know, a thousand people could say yes, that place is amazing, and a thousand people could say the same place is terrible. So I think we just have to explore more mm-hmm. and see what is right for us. All right, that makes sense. So, all right, down Sycamore Lane, how did you install your stone rug in the hydrangea room? All right, down Sycamore Lane, it's way easier uh, than you would think it is. The hardest part is lugging the rocks from wherever you are sourcing them. That's the hardest part. So basically Mm -hmm. what we did is we just laid them on the pattern we wanted. And then I took a garden knife and I just like carved around the outside, like right along the edge of the stone into the grass, you know, probably Mm -hmm. a few inches down, flipped the stone up, and then I just ripped the grass out, put the stone back in the hole that it left. And it looks a little raggedy around the edges for a little bit, but that fills in quick enough. Yeah, grass. two, three weeks, the grass and the soil, like if you have, especially if you have a good rain, everything just like fills right in yeah, there. Yeah, the hardest part is just lifting the stones, but it's yeah. it's pretty simple. Uh, Ooh, that's this a oh, it's little. Denise and Bob's Great Adventure would like to know, Christopher, what is the date of your open garden? It's in late July this year. A couple weeks earlier, I'm not sure exactly what the date is. It is, it's somewhere in the 20s. Oh, yeah. Somewhere in the July 20s, somewhere. But we will, you know, make sure it's posted and make sure everybody knows. Mm -hmm. But it's definitely in the second half of July. Yeah, it'll be fun. Jay Peters asks, Mm -hmm. besides longing for summer, what do you do in the winter for the garden? Um, Besides longing for summer, (laughs) which we do, and spring, um, we go out pretty often, check for damage from, like, critters, little voles or mice, or if the deer have come through, or if the rabbits are out, we do check for that. Mm -hmm. Um, See if anything's, yeah, basically we check for damage from weather or storms, you know, occasionally branches get broken. We're in a very windy area as well. Um, And then late winter, we'll do our pruning and that sort of stuff. mm -hmm. But there's definitely, you know, the end. December and January, those are pretty quiet months in the garden. Yeah, but also, what do you do in the winter for the garden is you get seeds ready. Yep, I start doing my seed stuff, um, organize the garage. So like, usually when we stock up on our fertilizers and things, oh, the this time of year is when yeah. we stock up on them so that they're ready to go and like that extra expense doesn't seem too wild mm-hmm. um, at the time of year. Get them now because they're available, um, things like that. We kind of just prep. For the garden yeah. season. Or garden preppers. Yeah. <laughs> um, Marge would like to know, the north side of my home gets speckled light in the morning for about two hours, then full shade. Do you have any suggestions on what I could plant there that has some sort of flowers and isn't super low to the ground, i.e. just ground cover? Zone 8A, Texas. Thank you. Okay, so we're waiting in the next few months to see the sweet and low sweet box bloom. This is a new plant. It's a saracoca, I believe, the sweet box plant. That is going to get, I believe, three to four feet tall. So not super short, but it will flower in the shade. I did a little bit of digging on this one. It's hard to get things that are going to bloom, but 
there is a plant, if it works in your zone, we saw one in Michigan. Do you remember the bottle eye br or the bottle brush buckeye? I don't. It is the coolest plant. It's a native. It I'm gonna look it up gets while you're talking. Gigantic if you um, let it go into a tree form. But bottle brush buckeye gets really awesome flowers on it. Um, Wait till he sees this picture. Oh, yeah, I've seen this before. But wait, look at that. Isn't that cool? Yeah. And that one's supposed to do well in shade. So if that works in your zone. 6 to 12 tall. The north side, I'm going to go so... But I feel like most hydrangeas are harder to zone 8 or zone 9. And to... if she's in Texas. Oh, um, well, maybe. You could definitely do some oak leaf hydrangeas, I think. I mean, I don't. I mean, we're, we're kind of shooting from the hip. Ha uh, ha, Texas. Right. Huh? Um, <laughs> Because we don't know Texas, you know, climate. But I think that any type of like maybe an oak leaf hydrangea could do well there, or maybe some type of Annabelle could work there. Oh, yeah. um, I don't think it'd be enough sun for a panicle, but so maybe start with a smaller hydrangea specimen, or um, check out that bottle yeah. brush buckeye. I just think they're so cool. Yeah. All right, Jay Devine or Divine. You have such a beautiful garden. Thank you. I enjoy watching your channel. I Thank must you. ask about the river birch because I plan to plant two in my backyard next spring. From what I read, these birches don't play well with other shrubs or trees planted nearby. Since you planted your birch, have you experienced any damage or loss to surrounding plants? Are you concerned that as the birch tree grows, it will damage neighboring plants? Um no to all of those things i don't birches are very common in our area yeah. i mean they line the highway they line all the areas and they're part of the landscape in mm -hmm. our area they're never just singular birches sitting on their own with nothing around them yeah they're um, definitely something that we can incorporate into any flower bed not have any problem give them lots of water yep. i mean maybe they grow really fast they do require a little extra pruning and limbing up you know, to keep them neat and pretty. I mean, we have neighbors in our neighborhood that have the same river birches that don't tend to them like we tend to ours. And it is much messier looking mm -hmm. and it does drop debris, but it doesn't damage the plants around it. No, I could almost see maybe in a situation where there isn't enough water happening for the river birch that maybe it reaches out and kind mm -hmm. of dominates everything else stealing yeah water. we were very specific about where we planted ours we planted ours at the lowest points in our garden mm -hmm. in the wettest points of our garden because yep. we knew they would do well there so i guess we should have started with that as we we chose those spots for our river birches because they are river birches and we put them in the wettest spots in our garden mm -hmm. um i guess citing them correctly is probably the a great first step right yep Pretty Little Boxes asks, plants on your wish list for 2024. Oh, we're writing a list. We have a long, 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 long list. Um, actually, I think we're, we? <laughs> we do. We've got a whole bunch of these Google Docs ready to go. Oh, yeah. Oh. Um, so we're going to be putting a list together that we're going to share with you so we can show you exactly what is definite, what is, you know, it's so funny. You can't really say need versus want when it comes to the garden, mm -hmm. but um, want and then really, really want. Yes. I think we might be able to put that together soon. Um, yeah, so some of the plants on my wish list for 2024 are some Rise Up Lilac Days for some containers out front. Mm -hmm. um, I'd really like for our annuals on the terrace, I'd really like to, you know, explore some more of the peach fuzz color things for the Pantone color of the oh, year. Oh, yeah, peach fuzz. I love that color. <laughs> it's good. It's beautiful. Um, always hydrangeas, always roses, and then just like really nice, fun annuals. There's some plants on our perennial wish list. Yeah, too. there's I'm looking... a nice thelictrum. Oh yes. that uh, we have on our wish list that's coming our way. Uh, but we're gonna share it all with you. Mm -hmm. uh, Josh would like to know: Do you guys grow from seed indoors? Yes, and if so, what is your setup? Um, just a bit of patience, I ask you for. We will be sharing that with you very soon. Yep. There's a whole setup in the basement. <clears throat> Melinda Miller would like to know, was there anyone who inspired you to garden? So obviously everyone's favorite, Laura, Garden Answer, mm -hmm. was absolutely one of the first people we started watching on YouTube that really inspired us. I remember exactly how I found her 
We were at the garden center because we were trying to re-landscape our new home and I had seen a beauty berry bush and the purple purple berries really caught my eye. And so I was Googling them and up popped her Pearl Glam beauty berry bush video on YouTube. And I clicked on her video and watched her. And I was like, Christopher, you got to watch this person. She is quick. She's precise. She's Mm -hmm. thorough with her stuff. And I feel confident after I watched Mm -hmm. that video. And uh, we became big Laura fans right away. Yep. And we can report that both Laura and us have not succeeded with that program. <laughs> it just doesn't work for yeah, us. Yeah, it didn't really work for us either. <laughs> and then, you know, from there, poking around YouTube more, we found Aaron, the impatient gardener, yep. who has been providing great information and mm-hmm. has a wealth of knowledge. Uh, Jim Putnam, we've enjoyed watching. And of course, we watched the British gardeners. We watched Monty Don and Carol Klein. Adam Frost. Adam Frost. And what's so interesting Gardener's is World is actually, great. Yeah, Gardener's World. We got that subscription to BritBox. And a few years ago, remember when we all had a whole lot of time on our hands? Mm-hmm. We watched seasons and seasons of Gardener's yeah, World. And I, true. that was, for me, when it became less about, hey, let's make our lawn look nice. And I suddenly felt like I want to be a gardener. Mm -hmm. I want to do this. I want to start seeds. I want to care about the soil and care about just making this beautiful world around us Mm -hmm. was really from Gardener's World. Yeah. Um, Ryan McAllister, who is the head gardener from Martha Stewart. Oh, right. Yep. He's... Got, he's got some great stuff, and he's I think he's on Martha Gardens on Roku. If you want to watch Ryan McAllister, he's really oh, right cool. on his little TV show. Okay, so this is a longer question, but this is one that I think Eric can really oh, speak wow, it is to. Long. Okay, this is hello from Louisiana. This is from Natural Six Five Seven. I have heard you mention in some videos that we had purchased the plant as a quart size. I'd like to ask, how do you maintain a quart size shrub plant or tree? I just began to garden. I purchased over 150 plants throughout the last summer and 90% were quart sizes. Do you trim the little growth that they have or leave them alone? Let's start there. Okay, well, good job, 150 plants. That's great. I love quart sizes too because they're really easy to get in the ground. Yeah, it's just like zip, zip, get them in the ground. So the first part of your question, um, you do trim the little growth that they have or leave them alone. I would leave them alone the first couple of seasons to let them get established because they're in the ground. If they're in the greenhouse, I would keep pruning them to shape them or get, mm-hmm. you know, to encourage more growth. But those first couple of that first season or two in the ground, just let them get established and get their roots into the ground so that they're not focusing on promoting new growth. Because the difference in a can at the garden center or at the greenhouse grower is they're constantly getting fertilized and they're constantly getting sheared to promote new growth. But it's a different environment once it's in the ground. Then they're kind of like getting the nutrients out of the soil, right. getting their water out of the soil. So you want them to get those roots deep in. So I would leave them alone the first year and then prune to shape depending on what kind of shrub it is. If it's something that blooms on old wood, I wouldn't prune it at all. If it blooms on new wood, you know, just start shaping it real pretty. Mm-hmm. The next part of the question is, most gardeners say to plant them at ground level, but with quart sizes, it's a little hard in the south. It rains all the time and the roots end up exposed. What do you do? Um, Did the roots end up exposed because the soil around the plants washed away? That's kind of what I'm gathering. I would make sure I mulch in that case. I, I tend to plant high. I'm a high planter. I tend to, everything tends to be like a half inch out of the ground, above the ground, because I like to mulch up to it. So I'm a high planter. You're not a high planter. Right. And now you're in the South, so I don't know if the compost as mulch would work for them. But we really do, it's like, not not, not that we're creating little hills for everything, but really just imagine that you can maybe just keep a couple buckets of uh, compost or soil that you can just top dress all the time and just kind of keep them nestled down until their roots take care of themselves. Yeah, but even just like I just realized now, I'm a high planter, you're not. Right. But things are still successful. So there's no like yeah. hard and fast rules. But it sounds to me like if the roots keep getting exposed, that maybe the soil needs to be packed in a little firmer around it mm-hmm. and then mulched. Yeah, that sounds right. It's a really good question because it's such an awesome option. It's economical. You, especially 150 plants, you really made huge impact. Yeah, we've planted a lot from quart size. Our Invincible Spirit 2s on the east side are mm-hmm. were quart sizes. Our um, Firelight Tidbits in the front were quart sizes when they arrived. Yeah. Our Wee White Hydrangeas were quart sizes. So we definitely have planted quart size. Yeah, so just let them, great success. leave them alone for a little while. Yeah, at least the first year, leave them alone. Yeah, keep them well awesome. watered. 
Thank you for that question. Now it's a great one. All right. Colin would like to ask, are you embracing the new hardiness zone map boundaries and diving into zone six plants? Or are you taking a more cautious approach to try more tender plants in your garden? Well, I will tell you when the map came out, we we looked at it and really didn't know what uh like what was going to be different for us we're about a mile away from the line of 6a mm -hmm. so clearly we are a 5b 6a kind of garden yeah and i looked back at our weather reports and we had we had several years in the last couple of years where we were technically zone seven. We never went below zero. I mean, yeah, we've had things come back that are harder to zone seven and zone eight have yeah. come back. In we had gladiolas garden. come back. Yeah, which are not supposed to be harder <laughs> for us, but they've come back quite a bit. So we um, are not a full, you know, zone six. We might, there. there is a zone six shrub from Proven Winners that we're, we're getting. I want it. Um, the Chitalpa. Yes, um, I want it. Which is zone six. So we're going to try it. Um, but again, it's one of those things where it goes back to that budget where to be quite transparent, if it was, if we were purchasing them and we were spending the money, I wouldn't yeah. purchase something in zone six or zone seven yet. But if it's going to be given to us to trial in our garden, I'm happily going to trial it. Yeah. And the thing, it. especially a lot of plants as we're learning, just because something dies back to the ground, doesn't mean it's not going to come back up. Doesn't mean it's not going to bloom still. Um, so we'll get that really good experience. I think that we've been like, you know, 10 years from now, we'll definitely be getting moved up again or, you know, whenever they're going to do another hardiness zone map. They really sprung that on us, didn't they? Yeah. <laughs> and also there's microclimates within our garden too. Uh, we live in a, we live right on a river valley kind of. So mm -hmm. we have really harsh wind from the West. We have very moist, humid summers. We get very freezing, heavy, wet snow in the winter. So really, hardiness zones for us are a guide as to what rootstock is not going to die over the winter, right. but it doesn't indicate to us what's going to do well in our garden. Yeah, and I mean, of course, we haven't had more than a quarter inch of snow so far this year. So things are definitely in flux. And then, of course, this year we had one of the latest frosts we've ever had mm -hmm. that last year. My, that's going to take me a while this year, I think. So to answer your question, Colin, <laughs> we're taking a cautious approach. Um, mm -hmm. We're trying more. We'll, I mean, we'll try some stuff. All right. So we have one more question. Last this question. is from J.D. Berta. What do you enjoy most about sharing your gardens on YouTube? What's been a challenge and plans for the channel and gardens in the new year? All right. How, how honest do we want to be? <laughs> <laughs> I think we should be very honest. Okay. So sharing our gardens on YouTube. We started this in July, right at the end of July. And we filmed the ground the whole time. We, I don't think, we very rarely filmed ourselves in those first yeah, couple videos. Yeah, I think it's very hard to put yourself out there on camera. I was very reluctant to and very shy to. Yeah, and that was really the main thing. Um, we were encouraged by some of our content creator friends that we've made through um, our, new, uh, our new connections. Mm -hmm. And so we did it. We dove in and... So this... what do you enjoy about sharing your garden? What do I enjoy? I... I like the feeling of being able to inspire others um, in the work that I do for a living. I'm a hairdresser, so I'm always helping people reach potential. That's kind of my core of what I do is I'm helping people reach their full potential of confidence and beauty and all of that. So with YouTube, I feel like we are enjoying ourselves and sharing what's beautiful and works for us in our garden and helping people to find their potential in their own gardens. Yeah, I feel the same way. I mean, also with YouTube, there becomes, you know, there's motivation when you're, when you're like, oh, I'm not going to do that. But you're like, oh, but I should because people need to know this. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, you're kind of held a little bit more accountable, which oh, is nice. Sure. <laughs> you're held yes. a little bit more accountable. There's also, you know, the monetary benefit of being mm -hmm. on YouTube. You do make a little bit of money off of some of the ads that run. So that's, you know, always a bonus. But we're doing the work anyway. So then sharing it with people is just an added bonus and getting the positive feedback or getting ideas mm -hmm. from people that we would never have thought of. Um, but that also ties into what's been a challenge is sometimes 
negative feedback or criticism or comments on like um, our bodies or how we talk or mm -hmm. things like that's very difficult. Yeah, um, that was expected. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, it, it's not the norm. It is uh, on the rare side. We appreciate that, of course. Um, but in a technical way, I had to learn how to use iMovie. Mm -hmm. And I had to learn about filming things and Eric had to learn about filming things. And what is a gimbal and microphones that are tucked underneath your shirt? And there's a lot of behind the scenes but stuff. But I think that's been fun too. Oh yeah. I think, you know, and my highlight of last year and our beginning of the journey was when I edited that um, Game of Thrones sounding music over you. Oh yeah. <laughs> he was cutting down hydrangeas with um, the hedge trimmer and it I just had this amazing idea to put it in slow motion and yeah. put thunderous music over it. yeah it made me very happy but I and I, I think for years I remember because I I run the Instagram a lot of people would say are you doing a YouTube do you have a YouTube and I'd always say it's not our thing like neither one of us want to edit videos it's just not our thing but never say never and um and it's a good thing we didn't yeah but plans for the channel and gardens in the new year. There are a lot of plans for the garden, as we kind of mentioned earlier in the video. I think as far as the channel goes, you know, in starting in March, we'll start going back to two days a week. It'll be Tuesday and Friday again, with the occasional third video, depending on what we can yeah. accomplish mm -hmm. that weekend. Um, but, but yeah, hopefully it just keeps... There's some very, there's something very exciting coming in March that we can't wait to share with you. Something that's a very fun adventure. Oh, yeah. That yeah, we have fun. a really fun I was adventure like, What's coming. coming? March. And then we have <laughs> another fun adventure in July. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's some stuff going on. Actually, there's a, a small adventure coming in a few weeks. Yes. So, so there's some fun stuff coming. But as for the channel, we're just going to keep doing what we do mm -hmm. um, and go back to two to three times a week in spring throughout the growing season. And, you know, obviously we appreciate you guys so much for joining us and following us and being so supportive and 99.9% .9 of our comments and feedback are super positive and so many great ideas. And I love that we're creating a little community underneath our videos every morning. So thank you so much. Again, I'm Eric and I'm Christopher and we are Grow For Me Gardening. Thanks for growing with us.